thank you all so much for joining us this evening tonight. Uh, my name is Salvador Munoz, and I'm the Public Programs Manager at Poster House, which was established in 2019 and located in the Manhattan neighborhood of Chelsea. Poster House is the first and only museum in the United States dedicated to the art and history of the poster. So before we get started, I just wanted to share a few notes on accessibility for this virtual event. Um, automated closed captioning is available for those who need it, and you can turn it on or off by clicking the CC button on the bottom of your screen. This program is being recorded and will be made available for all registered attendees after the event. Um, and all attendees will have the opportunity to ask uh, Cheryl and Douglas questions at the end of the program. And you can drop your questions in the chat or the Q&A box and our moderator will voc vocalize them during the Q&A portion. So now that that's out of the way, it is my immense pleasure to welcome you all to tonight's program, Genius on Display, Expanding Access with Cheryl Miller. In this expansive conversation, Cheryl will highlight the talented but overlooked Black and racialized designers of the 1960s and 70s, the era Poster House's current exhibitions focus on, with particular attention paid to the policies that reinforce their exclusion in this time period. Now, for those of you who don't know who Cheryl Miller is, which uh, you all should, because she is a living legend, uh, she is recognized for her outsized influence within this profession to end the marginalization of BIPOC designers through her civil rights activism, industry expose trade writing, research rigor, and archival vision. Miller is a national leader on minority rights, gender, race, diversity, equality, equity, and inclusion and advocacy in the field of graphic design. And this year, Cheryl became the first person in history to win both an AIGA medal and Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Museum Award in the same year. Tonight's program is moderated by Douglas Davis, a member of Poster House's CMYK committee uh, who is sponsoring tonight's event. Douglas enjoys being one of a variety of voices needed in front of and behind the concept, marketing plan, or digital strategy. As author of Creative Strategy and the Business of Design, Douglas regularly contributes uh, to the design discourse. Douglas is the former chair of the Emmy Award-winning BFA in Communication Design Program at New York City College of Technology in Brooklyn and serves on the advisory board of University of Oregon's Masters in Advertising and Brand Responsibility and City College Masters in Branding and Integrated Communications. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Douglas and Cheryl. Salvador, thank you so much for those words. And uh, it is a pleasure to be here with all of you who are joining us around the world. I wanna say thank you and welcome. Um, I know that Salvador said I would be a moderator, but uh, as you all know, Cheryl Miller does not need a moderator. So I will do my best to jump in here and there at the very, very end. Um, and just as I listen to her take us through the timeline of events that have happened on the, or if you let me start this over if you really think about the show right now our um our show that we have at the poster house hopefully you all get a chance to to come and see it um the pushpin show what i love about what Cheryl miller does is she's able to put into context all the things that were also happening on the peripheral um the show itself has a a, a very particular focus but i love all of the um, blanks being filled by what Cheryl does and how she researches, as you all know. So I am going to do my best to listen. Um, as Cheryl always says, buckle up. And uh, I do want to know what you have cooking, um, what you may have not have uh, uh, published so far. So again, I, I will have a role, but uh, like many of you, hopefully you all have questions and you'll put them in the chat. But I cannot wait to learn um, and put together so many different connections. There's, as Cheryl, you take us through um, all of the history and then the things that have been forgotten in a lot of the shows. So thank you to Poster House for hosting us tonight. And uh, without further ado, our genius on display tonight, Cheryl Miller. Thank you, listen, thank you everybody. And um, thank you for all my friends and Poster House and Douglas. Um, I'm gonna thank everybody again. Uh, this is really a chock full lecture. <laughs> and I'm excited about it because it is um, brand new content. Uh, and I'm gonna thank everybody. Um, I have a lot of sous chefs that helped me with, with um, 
the nutrition that I serve out. And so we, we'll, we will make sure to acknowledge everybody, but let me get busy um, and uh, get, um, get my PowerPoint up and please, please um, take notes. Um, and um, I'm here to the last question is answered. And um, again, the uh, link for the recording will be there and you can share with uh, uh, your students and, you know, I'm leaving, Douglas, I'm leaving it with intentionality these lectures on my YouTube. Um, I'm leaving a footprint, a footprint of footnotes. Uh, I may never, ever, ever get to write all the books, um, but you guys need your content and your foot, foot, footnotes to do the work um, of the next generation. So um, you can make sure you just quote me and do your Chicago style accurately. I wanna give you enough information. Uh, and we're gonna talk about that at the end, you know, what my work is. My, my goal is to leave you the content. You know, I got a couple of good, good books out of me <laughs> to, to come, um, but you guys are gonna be the future scholars and writers and revisionist historians. So let's get busy, take your notes. You'll have a recording, you can come back and what did she say? What did she say? Uh, but let me let me get busy saying it. Okay, so I'm going to share screen. Go to my PowerPoint, and we're going to start the show. And Okay, so um, Douglas, give me a thumbs up. You should see a yellow um, push pin. Okay, um, the name of this lecture is Pins That Push Back. <laughs> Pins That Push Back. Um, my, ch my challenge for us tonight, I, um, you know, my work has become so uh, gripping, controversial, uh, convicting. Um, I want you to engage with me and do something with this lecture, all right? Uh, take some kind of action, use this lecture in your journey, some way, somehow, adopt a spot to be better than this lecture. Um, and uh, we're going to go through a few things, not only the information, but I'm going to explicitly ex uh, explain how I do my research, um, give you some tips for how to dig deep into um, your own work, whether it's lectures that you're preparing or um, your own studies and, and advanced work or graduate work or whatever. I'm gonna share with you um, some of my tips. So not only is the information, but I wanna show you how to do this. Um, okay, so let's... The first thing that's really important, okay, is that I ask a lot of questions and then I go after the answers. I pay attention to every question, every hunch. Um, we all get whispers and then, you know, you go, what? And then you don't, I stop at every one. I, I don't let a, uh, a hunch, a whisper, I don't let one go by. And it may seem impossible. Some of the questions that come to me, you would think, I would think, oh, I, I don't know how I'm gonna get that answer. I might jot them down, but you know, I've been doing this so long, I pay attention to what is that? Why is that? Okay, and it haunts me until I get busy digging for an answer. So wherever it leads, and that's the thing, I never know what, where the truth is going to lead me. Um, I stop and pay, pay attention. For those of you who are teaching the canon, let's look carefully. The Pushpin group and this lecture, it falls in um, AY week 14-ish, depending on your academic year. Um, it is the the lessons of the eclectic modernism, 1950s to 1970s, the conceptual image concept, the psychedelic era, it's, it's 
called either eclectic modernism or the psychedelic era. It happens in teaching the graphic design history. This is your canon around, depending on your academic year when it starts and closes before Christmas, or uh, if it's a spring course, it's going to be somewhere around uh, academic year 14. And one of the things in this era that um, one of the things in this era that is the key to my work is I do what we call um, synoptic forensic work. Synoptic is different than um, parallel. Synoptic is just take a major event like January 6th. You will have um, BBC reporting it, Fox reporting it, CNN reporting it, ABC reporting it, NBC reporting it. There's one event. And it's not like it's two events parallel. There's one event with several lenses. And so I've learned, and um, uh, yeah, I've learned to use synoptic um, forensic tools, if you will. What else is going on and who else is reporting um, the same event? One of the things in our industry is that there's only been one perspective up until I would say the last maybe stretch 10 years, there's only been one viewpoint and that's been your Eurocentric New York City uh, uh, mid-century era uh, uh, view of the canon and uh, the industry and its players. And I've always contend there's a whole lot going on, okay, that's not being reported by, you know, the major, the major trade magazines of the time. And um, we used to get hard copies of print magazine and CA, and there was only one viewpoint. So with that, this lecture drops down into a synoptic timeline of some very important things. Pushpin is operating through some very important times. And we can't, we have to drop them and everybody else in this context and this tension of history and culture. So just look at this timeline. We've got JFK is assassinated in 1963, the Civil Rights Act, which did away pretty much as best as possible. Jim Crow, 1964, the Voting Rights Act, 1965. Malcolm X is assassinated in 1965. Miscegenation Act 1967, many of you don't realize that you couldn't cross marry and it was definitely white folks couldn't marry any black folks. Okay, so now it's all, it was, it, listen, this law would have everything all, everybody having a cardiac right now because everybody's coming from around the world everywhere. Globalization has put us falling in love everywhere. Okay, but back then it was ba basically white folks, you're not marrying black folks. That's just not the way it is <laughs> until 1967, it was illegal. Um, MLK was assassinated in 1968. R RFK was, Bobby Kennedy was assassinated in 1968. Listen, women weren't smoking. They made a little Virginia Slim. It was like a little, almost like a chopstick, okay? And right, a long, all right, kind of, you know, feminine cigarette. Um, you know, uh, that brand came out in 1968, Vietnam War, Woodstock, Kent, Stock, uh, Kent State, and Pushpin, okay? And this is all happening. They're dropping in right in the middle of the civil rights era. And you've got, that's the biggest piece that begins to say, well, where's everybody else? Where's everybody else? Pushpin, Pushpin is having a blast. Now, when you're teaching, this falls in a whole trajectory of, like I said, we're about, we, you know, we start with the manuscripts and this is the canon, okay? So my goal is I don't necessarily wanna teach Black graphic design history, what, what I seek to do is decolonize the canon, which is entirely different, all right? And um, I want to um, show you some other things in the basic canon. Uh, just to pause, I wanna make sure, I've lost video with Douglas and Poster House, we good? All right, so um, for those of you who are educators, you know this, you, you guys know this better, better than I do. Um, and uh, we're down, we're down, you know, coming into Thanksgiving. So this particular lesson is this, this is the canon. And so we know um, that Pushpin Studios and Psychedelic, the whole thing has been inspired from Japanism. Okay, so when we're studying and, and uh, looking at Art Nouveau, we know those influences, Japanism is influenced um, Art Nouveau, okay? And in, in an order of teaching and it, right? 
this is coming down into the major move of the Japanism into um, uh, Art Nouveau that we hit right into this is the inspiration and the psychedelic movement um, starts. And um, the players, this is Wes Wilson. I'm not gonna teach you. I'm not here to teach you what you already know, but we're showing how to decolonize. I just don't wanna give you black graphic design history. All right, this is how Cheryl Miller is decolonizing AY14. Okay, it's the way I research, the way I ask questions, the way I integrate it because it's a synoptic story. And that's my work and that should be our work in addressing what's going on in, in uh, design education. So I just don't teach black graphic design history, okay, which you, I can come by and do that if you want. My goal is to help be a revisionist historian into the canon, to broaden it, okay, to make put the synoptic lens on this. So with that, um, for example, here's a question that needs to be answered for me. So this is, I'm just showing you like, all right, this is my lecture, but these are some questions, okay? And sometimes the answers are make sense, and sometimes the answers don't make sense. Sometimes the answers are too truthful. Um, so here, just as an example, I have a question about the Pushpin website, okay? And I put this on Instagram, and after Reynold Ruffins died, I thought someone would have answered it, but. I have found this key, this originating photo. I have found this in several places. What I found curious about the Pushpin website is that Reynolds Ruffins number 15 is missing. The key is missing. So I begin to ask the question, is that intentional? Is that, how could that be? Is it an error? Okay, these are graphic designers. Is it an error? Okay, but I have seen this chart and this photo in other places and everybody is identified. So that's an example of why, why is Reynolds key number 15, why is he missing? He's there, but you can see everybody else has a number and he's sitting there with no number. All right, there's a truth to that. Either somebody made a mistake, no one's paying attention, maybe it was intentional. I, I don't know, but I know I've seen this chart and Reynolds was there. So this is what, you know, this is like, that can be controversial. If I, if I call up pushpin.org and say, why is that missing? Oh, Ms. Miller, well, well, it's an error. I'm like, well, you're graphic designers. How is that an error? Or is it an agenda? I'm not accusing anything. I just point questions and I look for questions and get answers to questions that people don't ask. Um, and so that's a part of a whisper. Why is that? Um, our main central figure um, is Milton Glaser. We know that. Who doesn't love Uncle Milty? <laughs> He's wonderful, okay? Um, and the main focus, notice the beautiful collection of his work. All right, and you know, I'm gonna show you my question that I'm gonna seek to answer I just had one question and I've been all over LinkedIn with it. Why did he get all the black work? And now think about it. When I was growing up, a part of my inspiration, I was asked recently, Cheryl, were you inspired by the album covers? I said, yeah, when I, I saw these album covers, I thought things would be fair. I want to do that. So here I'm in Washington, Washington D.C. dancing in the park and Aretha Franklin album under my arm. And I'm like, oh, I wanna go do that. But I, you know, I'll come back to this question, but look at this catalog of Milton's black work. The Gregory, Hugh Masekela, um, Aretha Franklin, Stevie Wonder, it goes on. Every time I turn around, I find a piece of work that Milton has done that could have gone to the black community. I'm like, well, why is that? <laughs> How is that? That's not very fair. <laughs> okay. It's a, it's a curious note. And then I'm like, where I think I really became like, oh my God, what is going on? Is this is the Lincoln Center um, Easter Sunday 
poster, Mahalia Jackson. All right. And then I discover, um, just digging a little bit, that Milton is inspired by um, a 19, an 1890 synagogue, which became um, Chicago's Pilgrim Baptist Church. And this was a home base for Mahalia Jackson. He took the arches and it became inspiration. It's genius. But how come a black designer wasn't doing this? I got to ask, all right? And I'm going to give you some answers. Um, Reynolds Ruffin, uh, he, and you'd be surprised how many people really aren't aware that Reynolds Ruffin is a black man who was an original founder of Pushpin Studios. Now, because of the internet and our work, you know, it's been going along. But when I first put that out there, God knows when, people are like, really? I'm like, really? And the problem I'm having with this history, Douglas, is that there are places that slip and slide with it. And slip and slide with it is like, well, he was there, he wasn't there, he was there and he left, he was there, right. Listen, the five 1954 founders, Seymour Quast, Reynold Ruffins, um, Ed Sorrell, Milton Glaser, these are the original founders, one black man. Um, I, I have more questions than answers most of the time. And um, I go deeper every day. And some of my questions that I'm gonna sh show you, I might not have all the answers. I have the questions tonight. And so it could be something that could be your thesis paper, um, your book, uh, your report. I'm just stirring you. It's okay to ask questions of this gospel of graphic design. It's okay to challenge the gospel of graphic design because we're going to get to the truth of it. All right. I, I don't have all the answers, but between all of us, if we will be earnest to our questions, we will have some truths. Now, I want you to watch this. This is one of my deep dive questions. Okay, this is a uh, um, typical brochure. Uh, there was a, these were little um, almanac brochures where they, the collective came up with doing stories and graphics and they had a great audience. They would send them out and it would be a way to promote the illustrations and so forth and get clients. Now, honestly, I look at this and I'm like, what do I see? Well, the first thing I see is um, a Harlem Renaissance influence. And I see um, what a lot contend is Afro, Afro Deco from Harlem Renaissance era. But I see a heavy German influence. And I begin to ask my questions about what's the meaning of this? What am I looking at? Where does it come from? Okay, I'm squarely seeing um, German Gothic black face type, like type, genre of type. I see, I see in forensic looking, I see um, Harlem Renaissance uh, ar architecture, uh, typeface, and I see what community thinks is Aaron Douglas. It is not, okay? The tree of this look is Ryan Hall Rice. And there is on my YouTube, Douglas, there's a full Harvard lecture on Ryan Hall Rice, who his mentor is von, Franz von Stuck. These are German modernists. And Ryan Hall Rice drops into Harlem as an immigrant. And he goes and he settles in to Harlem right at, right at the height of the Harlem Renaissance. He works on a project with um, Elaine Locke. And Elaine Locke meets him. Elaine Locke knows Aaron Douglas. And he pays for Aaron Douglas to get lessons from Ryan Hall Rice. Ryan Hall Rice becomes Aaron Douglas's mentor. 
and learns the style. And what you're seeing is an influence, a German modernist influence that has impacted Aaron Douglas. And we think every time we're on the internet and we see these images that they're Aaron Douglas, they are not. There's a portion of them that are, but these are the earnest ones that are Afro Deco. The father of Afro Deco is a German modernist, 1930, Weinhall Rice. Now you just Google that, or you go to my executive design lectures and you will see my footnote from Harvard and um, a symposium where they're not focusing on Aaron Douglas, they're focusing on the work of Reinhold Rice. And that portrait, they're analyzing the portrait of Langston Hughes. I'm like, okay, that's a truth. That's a fact. And we go around thinking that all, all of this is Aaron Douglas, only a portion of it is. And his influences have been German modernists and one in particular who tucks down into Harlem. Like I said, go to my YouTube and look for the Harlem lecture, okay? On Weinhold Rice from Harvard. It's not about Aaron Douglas, it's about his work. He's an immigrant from Germany. And so this influence on this uh, Almanac publication, I, I just have a question because Pushpin, there isn't anything that wasn't intentional. Everything was a message, okay? Every graphic, every illustration, every little book, there was a message. So ask Seymour. Seymour's still alive. What's the influence? See, that's, that takes courage. Mr. Quast, I recognize you. I honor you, how can I not? But can you tell me what that meant? When you were young and you did that, what, what were you sending the message? I don't have an answer. I just have a question. Um, Lauren Udemy and Fred Marshall, Lauren, Lauren Udemy was there in the beginning years with Reynolds Ruffin. And I have an interesting piece of ephemeral, okay? Um, the Japanese, the Japanese are interested in us. And I'm gonna explain that. But I got his bio from the Japanese. Uh, Mr. Yudame was born in the Bedford Stuyvesant Black Ghetto of Brooklyn 35, 37 years ago. That's at the point of this. He studied design at Cooper Union Art School and joined Pushpin Studios 1955. After leaving the studio, he held a variety of jobs in packaging and pharmaceutical design studios and was an art director at Columbia, Columbia Records. He now works as a freelance artist concentrating on record album and editorial art. Okay, I got that bio, 1955, I believe this is from the Japanese. Okay, I just got a fractal. Unfortunately, I can't tell you where the whole thing came from, but it's Japanese. We have Fred Marshall and um, Fred Marshall is, uh, this is a piece you can find him um, on, uh, Steve Heller's got him um, captured with print magazine. There's another gentleman, a third to be four black um, uh, designers for, for uh, Pushpin. The fourth one, I can't find anything on him at all. <laughs> okay. And then we, of course we have Ed Sorrell. So drop all of this. See what happens is when we're talking about this and pushing, you're not gonna see all this other stuff. You're just gonna see the main players. And so we end up with the main players with Ed, Ed Sorrell. Now, let's go back to my question. Why did Milton Glaser get all the black work? Okay, because there are a whole lot of black designers around. Well, how come he got everything? And none of it came to, none, 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 none of them came to the generation that was in front of me. So let's, let's, look, let's look at this. It starts with, the era starts 1950, but Jim Crow is stealing portfolios. And we're gonna talk about Jim Crow because I want, really want you to understand two main points about, you know, we don't have to go way deep, 
I just want you to understand two things about Jim Crow, and we'll be there in a minute. This is 1947. This is four years before I'm born. Okay, five years before I'm born. And in the era, getting ready to roll in to this story of eclectic modernism. This is um, Mr. Norris, um, and Mr. Norris sued, um, gets out of the service and sues MICA, Maryland Institute College of Art. Um, discrimination, he says uh, the school is um, funded by the government. He served, uh, I wanna go to school and the school would not let him in. He sues and he still doesn't get in. We could not go to school. We could not go to school, thanks to Jim Crow. Very few white schools would let anybody of color in. And I don't even know the criteria if one or two or three got in. We could not go to school, 1947. I am a child and teen of the eclectic modernism psychedelic era. I am a child with a coming of age story through this era. I lived through this trauma drama. I grew up in it and my eyewitness to it. This is in my other lectures, I go way deep. I'm authentically the original BIPOC designer. I have four, all these people behind me. I am four four grandparents, four different races, four different places. And all of these laws and the census laws, I drop down into one drop. I am a black woman raised African-American in Washington, DC. And what do I do with all of my family? That's why you see me on LinkedIn and everybody calls me OG BIPOC. Yep, OG BIPOC. Four grandparents, four different races, four different places, okay? Uh, and my parents met, you know, we'll come back one of these days and I'll talk, you know, I claim them all, okay? I'm Filipino, I'm white, I'm black, and it all, kind of, it all ended up <laughs> dancing in the streets in Washington, D.C. My parents met at Howard and some influences. I grew up in sitting watching um, all the artists that came through Howard Howard's um, gallery school. And on one side, and then I had all, all of the white, uh, uh, Corcoran, Hirshhorn, Smithsonian, um, all these influences during the time, right at the beginning of television. This Mickey Mouse was just the beginning of Mickey Mouse. And you all grew up with Bob Ross and I grew up with John Nagy who did charcoal drawings. I am a child of this era. I was born in 1952. This is Ted Shear, okay? And I'm gonna to talk to you about Ted Shear. And I'm gonna to talk to you about Jim Crow. Ted Shear, this is an article, I know Ted, well, I knew Ted, and I knew his son. Um, and Ted is, um, uh, he's known for a cartoon strip Quincy. He's an art director. By the time we get to the 70s, he's an art director. I think it's uh, BBDNO. And in 1953, 1953, he writes this article um, for the New York Age Defender. Now let's talk about, before I tell you what's in the article, let me explain Jim Crow. Two things that are important. It was the law. So it's the same thing like don't break the law. Don't break this law. This is the law, marginalize African-Americans. Stop them, it's the law. Just like if you rob, rob a bank, it's the law, it's a felony. <laughs> You're going to jail. This is a law, marginalize, do everything you can do to hinder any progress, a law. Here's another point of the law. Establish white people as above black people. It's the law. 
stop black people at every turn and make sure do whatever you can. This is, this is your, one of your systemic racist practices. This is the core of it. You must know that this era, it was the law to marginalize this. And this is a whole nother thing that's coming up out of slavery. You can read my articles on that. Why, why, why? Okay, and the understanding, it's, it, go, it goes deep to understand the trades and to understand this was commercial art. There's a history to this, okay? I had a choice, go, go academics or go mentorship through the trades. You know, there's a history, there's a trajectory. And back here, when this article was written, do everything you can do to stop black folks from getting anywhere and establish white folks over black folks. This is the way it was. Ted writes an article and he says, in this article, this is your first that I can see, I won't say there isn't another one in front of this. This is the first published record 1953 list of graphic designers and artists. He lists out everybody that he possibly knows from Aaron Douglas to Jacob Lawrence. He, he names, it's incredible the ones that he names, E. Simmons, um, um, Louise Jefferson is the only one that I see as a woman. Uh, we're analyzing this list. This is your first recorded history book this article, um, Ted Shear. So guess what? This is being published right along. This list is go right, going right along with Pushkin. Where are the black folks? Ted, Ted starts writing, everybody I know. This is my, I can't list it all. It's impossible, for, but this is my list. E. Simmons, Oliver Herring, Ted Carroll. Louise Jefferson. And then he's got a friend, Verdun Cook. Cook. Verdun Cook. Remember, I tell you. Okay. Now I know Ted. And I know, I knew him. And I knew his son. His son um, was a mentor to Gordon Parks. And he's the one we know him by the iconic um, John John picture. Okay. That's, that's John Shearer, his son. Okay. Now, let me explain one thing about this marginalizing black folks. I am, you, you can read my, you, you can read my memoir, ask me, call me, I'll tell you. I am Filipino descent is my crazy grandfather over my ear. I am Filipino descent because of Jim Crow. How could that be? Woodrow Wilson was the worst racist president in the middle of Jim Crow. And his main initiative was to derail African-American Navy men, get them out of the Navy. And their replacement, hire the Filipinos, put the Filipinos in. And all they were was the sub labor to the Negroes who cleaned up, they were the mess labor, the stewards, the barbers, the cooks, the mess labor on the ships. And Woodrow Wilson and Josiah Daniels, I believe it is, who was um, the, the uh, um, head of the Navy. Get the Negroes out of the Navy. In World War I, United States bought Danish West Indies, which we now go on Carnival Cruise, US Virgin Islands. And the Negroes were taken out and the Filipinos went. And my grandfather was one of eight Filipinos that landed in the US Virgin Islands. We established the first Filipino Caribbean um, family, World War I, all because Jim Crow and Woodrow Wilson said, get rid of the Negroes. And put in Filipinos. And my grandfather meets my grandmother's drama, drama from the Danish and Ghanaian slave trade. I've lived through this. 
these were our leaders. Martin, nonviolent, and Malcolm, let's just call him assertive. They were our civil rights leaders fighting against these laws and they were killed while pushpin is pushing a pin. Malcolm is murdered 1965. The rise of black nationalism and the Panthers and they, their main discipline and doctrine is the work of Malcolm X. They're, diff they're different, they're much different than Martin. They, they are purporting um, Malcolm X theories and doctrines. In this move of black nationalism, they begin 1966, a militia. In this, two things, Sylvia Abernathy, um, uh, I on Design ran an article about her today. You can get all of it. Everybody's now resurging and bringing, bringing out all this history. It's, it's it, we're, we're in a 50 year cycle of resurgence. Where are the black designers and everybody wants to have everything diverse now and decentered and all of this stuff. Okay, we're Vogue. The story is Vogue and it's trending, okay? And I'm just here telling you the truth. So if you're gonna do it, do it well and let it not be performative. But she designed the wall, the wall of respect. Listen, I went out to Chicago and it was a hundred year anniversary of Bauhaus and a 50 year anniversary of wall of respect. And I think they dismantled the wall, wall of respect and Bauhaus is still there in Chicago. And the collective, so the wall of respect is 1967. Oh, by the way, then, Thank God, I, I can't call her name, a PhD out of Howard. She pulls all of the work together, she, Soul of a Nation. You can Google that, all the celebrities and everything. And it, you know, went to one of the European fairs and blah, 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 blah. But you know what's happening now. And I, when I was out in Chicago, I told the bus driver, I told the one working in, in, in um, cleaning up the room on the elevators. I said, oh, anyone that I saw black, as a laborer in the hotel. I said, if your mother has this stuff in the garage, because now all of a sudden everybody wants it. I said, if your mom has this, I was telling everybody in Chicago, if you were black, I don't care what, you know, and I just put it to the workers because I'm in the hotel. <laughs> okay. And I'm like, if you see this in your mother's garage, do not let, don't give it to a white gallerist without calling me because now the galleries want this. And this is the collective work of Jeff Donaldson, Wadsworth Jarrell, Jay Jarrell, Robert, Robert Jones Hogu and Gerald Williams. They, the manifesto, go do your research. There was a manifesto. It's a collective of bad relative artists. This is going, look at the psychedelic influence of whatever the times. This is going right alongside of Pushpin and this show, the Afro Cobra, and now it's Soul of a Nation wherever it's traveled. And I think I have it in my executive. There's another scholar, another white scholar, PhD. They're analyzing the show. I'm not mad with it, but you should know this. And you should see how a lot of this for the African American community and scholar, we need to be doing this work. We can't leave this work to other people. And I appreciate allies that want to do it. But a part of being authentic is to make sure you have your facts right and you have the journey correct. And one of the things that I was influenced by Alma Thomas, Sam Gilliam, the Colorfield School, and my mom worked at Howard. My people were Howard people. I, I grew up sitting in the gallery when Jeff was there. These guys are 15 years older than I am. So as a kid, a teenager, when this stuff is going on, I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready to apply for college. And, you know, Jeff, I was there at the Howard Fine Arts in the sitting waiting for mama so I could get a ride home. I grew up with this imagery and this story. Come on, sit with that. Sit with it. Does it take a black man? Every time a black man dies, this is a reparation. 1968, sit with it. 
I just talked to, I just told AIGA DC, the next time you go to Starbucks at 14th and P, I want you to remember this. This look all across America, Main Street, urban USA, every town, every strip that now has um, Cava, Cava and Chipotle and Starbucks and gentrified restaurants and shops. This was my hometown. While pushpin is pushing pins. This was the image. This was the image. I live with Jackie Kennedy's image on life with her two babies on life and look. And oh, by the way, I live with Coretta's image on Ebony Magazine. Sit with it while push pin is pushing pins. Just stay with it. And if that wasn't good enough, Douglas, they, they killed, they, they, they killed Bobby Kennedy. There's an unknown story, I believe it's, don't quote me, I can't, don't do anything without foot, footnotes, but I think it's Michelle Miller, CBS. Her dad was the surgeon. I think that's the right, don't quote me. You'd have to do some work. He, he was the surgeon that pronounced him dead. That's her story, okay? That's her story. You can check that, confirm that. It's, it's, it's one of the broadcasters who's African-American, her dad, and we don't know these hidden stories. And she went and did the research to prove the oral tradition. They shot, they shot Bobby. They were getting ready, he was getting ready to become president. Anybody that was pushing back, okay, on that Jim Crow and trying to make things right, culture, society, and history, it was saying no way. The Panthers. Huey, Angela. Here's your origin. Black Lives Matter and the graphics that have morphed on Instagram. Okay, all of the new versions. And one of my favorite picket signs, Douglas, is European art the only art? No, demand black art. And I'm saying demand fair art. Fair art. I just, I'm, I don't want to, I'm, I have no intention about writing a black graphic design book. I have a, I have, I am a Doty professorship at University of Texas, Austin Design. And in this fellowship, they've allowed me to develop two classes, decolonizing or graphic design decolonized and branding for diversity. Cheryl, come work out your, your decolonized classes. And they're, they're, with the resource they're giving me, they're allowing me to write my books. And the main book I'm writing is not the history of black graphic design. It's graphic design decolonized, which it's my responsibility to teach you push pin, to teach you eclectic modernism to teach you the psychedelic era. That's my responsibility as a graphic design educator who I get it straight, don't get it twisted. I believe in the canon, but I'm gonna decolonize and decenter whiteness of it and show you contextually there are other things. So this is one of my lectures. This is how I'm writing it. Emory Douglas, listen, let me tell you the depth of Emory Douglas. If you see him in the lecture on Zoom, go. AI, AI 
GA medalist 2015-1968. This is the best I contextualize and have made genre. I have analyzed the black typographic and design system, which has nothing to do with our grid and the international type system. Listen, this is the best of origins of geometry developed from Jet Magazine, which I'm gonna show you, and uh, our DNA, our geometrics. And look here, one color, black, dropout, and duotone. That's what we had, Douglas, because we didn't have any money before these four color jobs. We had one color, and even one color would have been, I love how our DNA of design has morphed. I have a whole nother lecture on that. It's morphed. I, we have this golden rod and black thing all over Instagram. It comes from this era back in the 50s. Golden rod was a color yellow, and we could stretch, we could stretch a color. So yellow became the paper, and the paper of choice was golden rod with black with a dropout and duotone, and you could stretch what you could do. These are brilliant. We were backed up with no money on newspaper, no 100 pound gloss on that, newsprint. And now, Douglas, I've seen his lectures. He goes all around the world with his archives and his collection. It's brilliant. Social, political, social impact. Everybody wants to get into the genre. This is Black Panther graphics using Black folks graphic design technology. One color, a dropout, and a duotone. Dorothy Hayes in 1968. 68 is pivotal because everybody is responding. What can we do? What can we do? What can we do? How can we make reparation? How can we make right? What can we do? print. Now we've seen a resurgence of this article, the beginning of it. Um, it's November, December 1968. Dorothy Hayes, Bill Howell, William um, Wakasi, Alex, uh, Alex Walker, Dorothy Cubrero. I don't know her last name. I did my best with that. Okay. They are featured. Listen carefully now. Their perspectives. I don't think that I ever experienced so much discouragement and suppression of black artists and art instructors. Sounds like Instagram today. Treat the black student as though he was some out and out freak and tremendous threat to the instructor. Try to get a decent crit all over Instagram, ACAD, NASAD schools, the professor, the crit, the professor, the crit, the brand new work from um, Dr. Aaron Unfaker. Her brand, her brand, brand new um, uh, research published made me cry. She's analyzing the schools. And here Dorothy is saying, the way the art instructors are teaching us, like we're some out and out freak when all the student is trying to do is to develop talent. Wait a minute. Here, here, here. Same problem. How many years is this? This is Journal of Diversity. Get this footnote. Journal of Diversity. Out of my element, the Black, the experiences of the Black art students in critique. Dr. Erin N. S. Unkefer. She's now a, now a psychologist at Carnegie Mellon. Get her report. It's just written page after page after page of how we are treated in art school. And here's Dorothy telling you right here, 1968, because all of a sudden somebody wants to know, well, what's going on? She tells you right here, has anything changed? And then um, she says, uh, I was employed by a well-known broadcasting company and led to believe that I would hold a position, yet I was never allowed to do anything but non-creative work. You talk about tokenism and perform performative tech for a quota. And that we're doing something. Let's do this. I'm no actor. Don't if you you know I bring carnage 
and kind of just change. Don't call Cheryl Miller if you don't want change. If you're calling Cheryl Miller just to be calling Cheryl Miller to look like it's good to call Cheryl Miller, wrong. <laughs> wrong. You will not call me and it's like, well, we want change, but can everything stay the same? No. 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 No, no, and no. <laughs> no, no, and no. Just, I was just employed for tokenism. CA. 1968, how many black, now this is an interesting, if you can get this, you can, in the archives of PD. This is an interesting piece here. And they asked, everybody's starting to ask this question, where are we? How many black Americans will graduate from our school this year? Okay, what's interesting is, well, first off, you can answer yourself. If I just told you, could nobody go to school? Probably the five that they have on the cover, <laughs> right? Nobody could go to school. So how many could there possibly be graduating? The five on the cover. But inside is interesting because it begins to do some other things, stirring up conversation. It talks about a uh, tutor art program. You see some black students, you actually see some good black illustrations. Um, this, is, this is another piece in the card catalog, you know, um, very interesting. So both print, Douglas, both print and CA 1968 are starting to, um, tell, tell the story, you know, maybe something is going on here. Remember now, Pushpin, Pushpin is making money and making history. And that's the only thing anybody's ever talking about. We're still in the same, we're still in the same era, Douglas. We're still right here. We're still right here. 1968, make a statement, a theme of black and white. Impacta, listen, when I came along, Impacta was a good old lecture set. You rubbed it down. <laughs> Love the lecture set type, okay? Um, designed by Dave Davison. Um, and guess what they did to pour on, listen, right here, Dorothy Hayes was the kind of wiki page about a person not yet shown to meet notable guidelines. I told Steve Coles, okay? He ran, the, yeah, he ran, ran the, uh, the update article. And I said, Dorothy Hayes doesn't have a Wikipedia. <laughs> he said he was gonna correct it. I don't, I don't know if that's been done. But Wiki, Wiki tells this is no page for her. She, she hasn't made any contribution. Now, now Douglas, watch this, watch this. I have no Google. No mentor, no friends, no anything. All I want to do since I'm three years old. I told you I won my first award when I was a Girl Scout. I was 10. I ended up in the Washington Post on my birthday, December, December 16, 1952. <laughs> Who's going to help me? No Google the research. This woman here, rest, rest in peace, Miss Glassman, being 100% wrong. You will never be you will never be an artist. I'm like, I'm 16 years old, 17 years old, and you're gonna tell me I'm not gonna be an artist. Okay, all right. Two art teachers, one black, one white. Two art rooms with an art classes in between, Douglas. Two kids, one white, one black. Two out of all the art classes wanna go to art school. This woman did everything she could do to get me frustrated and keep my admissions from Rhode Island School of Design away because she wanted her student to go to RISD. They weren't gonna, they weren't gonna, back then they weren't gonna let two kids get the same admissions. The white, the white, my white counterpart wanted to go to RISD and I wanted to go to Pratt. Well, guess what? I ended up doing both, not all at the same time. Sometimes you can't get it all at the same time if you get a one in the order. <laughs> I got it anyway, one way or the other, okay. And so risk the application came into me, admissions came into me. And she did everything to frustrate getting my transcript, my, my yeah, my transcript to RISD. My, my highbrow political father had to call up, drive up in his Cadillac, cool it time, send that transcript to Rhode Island School of Design. This woman was trying to get in my way. I've been doing this since I was a teen. 
Dorothy, where are all the black designers? 1970, she, get ready Douglas, she answers. She answers. She and Joyce, Joyce calls up Dorothy and says, I haven't seen you in a while. Or they talk, I don't know which one calls it. I haven't seen you in a while. Let's get together. Joyce goes over to Dorothy. Dorothy gives her a few of the magazines that she's in from 1968. They come up with an idea. You know, we need to do a show because these people keep looking for us. And she's, Joyce says, Joyce says to Dorothy, I got a contact. And the contact led to Eli Cantor. Eli, Eli Cantor is the son of Saul Cantor. And these are the directors of Gallery 303 Composing Room. I think it's, I'll tell you in a minute. I think the address is 140. I'll give you the address in a minute. And they come up with, uh, you know, uh, I'm, 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 I don't want to reveal it all is what it is, but the two of them come together. <laughs> they come together, okay. Um, there's a critical difference in the stories. That's why I'm pausing. I got to keep you all intrigued some way or the other. But they come together to do black artists in graphic communication, okay? And there's a handwritten note there uh, of a manuscript about she's writing um, the commentary that goes for the show. Um, Joyce Hopkins and Dorothy begin these conversations with Eli Cantor, 1969. Um, At the same time, uh, we have uh, Barton A. Cummins, who is content advertising. He's the chairman of American Association of Advertising Agencies. He is challenged at um, a conference at the Waldorf Astoria, and everybody's wanting to figure out the future of the black man in advertising is in two sets of hands, he says. He gives a challenge and he says, his drive, his effort, his striving can be encouraged by you or discouraged. You can help or hinder. You can confront the situation or avoid it. You can build bridges or you can build walls. Okay, so right here, um, let's see, am I missing an important photo? No, I'm not. Um, this conversation of what to do and how to help and let Blacks in, but a lot of it is the back, the, the undertow of it is where we don't know where they are. And if we know where they are, they're not qualified. So the show was to um, inquisitive minds want to know the show. Look at this vintage photo. This is George Alden, Eli Cantor, Dorothy Hayes, Herb Lou Allen, Sidney Minson, Mailer Ryder. They have come together um, for, um, they've been working since February, 1969. The show opens January 8th. I got, really have to confirm there. Some notes say that it opens on the 7th and some say on the 8th. And so the newspapers and things, I'm gonna tighten that up, but um, the documents, one say the 7th, one say the 8th, but nonetheless, we're talking January. It, it takes from February, 1969, when Joyce and Dorothy meet Cantor to pull together this show um, at Gallery 303. This is a vintage photo uh, photograph that has had me to my knees. This is the show. These are the players. Um, look at this. Look at this, Douglas. Look at this, Douglas. Look at you smiling. This is your Curator picture, Selden Dix, Reynold Ruffins, Carl Over, Dorothy Hayes, Alex Oliver, Joyce Hopkins, Mail Ryder. This is um, your curation picture. 
the graphics and the bird is Reynolds Ruffin's concept and idea, and they have signed off. He designed the bird theme. And look at the signatures, Joyce, Carl, Alex, Naylor. They sign off. Here comes a question. And for this record, I'm going to acknowledge all 49. There were scheduled to be 50. I'm gonna read them. Dorothy Acubiero, Roosevelt Allison, Ramir Bearden, Charles Boyd, Cecil Brath, Ronnie Brathwaite, Orston Brooks, Eli L., uh, Wally Caldwell, Caldwell, T. Collins, Donald Cruz, Leo and Diane Dillon, Selden Dix Jr., Phil Dragon, Lauren Udemy, Tom Fillings, George Ford, Vernon Grant, Robert Gums, Ronald Harper, Dorothy Hayes, Joyce Hopkins, Bill Howell, Leroy Inwell, Inman, Louise Jefferson, Verona Whitaker, Richarder, Richard, Verona Richard, Josephine Jones, Roy Legrone, Vincent Lewis, Alexander Mapp, Andrea, Andrea Marquez, who I talk to every week. She's still alive. Bill Mason, Don Miller, John Morning, George Olden, Alex Oliver, Carl Over, Gordon Parks, Jerry Pinckney, George Pruden, Sam Reed, Reynold Ruffins, Mayla Ryder, Armin Sadik, Ted, Ted Shearer, John Steptoe, Otis Sullivan, Moselle Thompson, Alex Walter, Walker, Bernadine Watson, your 49 designers. Now, they're in this exhibit. Dorothy in her memoir binder, her notes, she is overwhelmed. She gets a call, I believe from Roy Legrone. Moselle Thompson has committed suicide. 30 days before the show opens in January, December 7th, she goes to the Amsterdam News and finds out the New York police said that the artist jumped from the sixth story of the roof where he lived and was impaled on the picket fence below. Why did he kill himself? Well, here's one of my questions. So why did he kill himself? What was he facing? I researched this guy, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. I found a quote from his brother. He was always struggling for money. He had no consistent income. He was a struggling artist. He dreaded getting lunch with executives who hired him. Jim Crow, Jim Crow, listen, when they found out he was black, they stopped hiring him. And gave or and or gave him less money. Marginalize is the law. Don't let a black man get anywhere. It's the law. He was his brother says he was tired of being taken advantage of in a world that never appreciated him. Listen carefully, you connect the dots. A long time male companion. He shared an apartment with, left for Chicago, leaving him distraught. He exited from his window. I got this piece of ephemeral. Moselle Thompson, LP cover illustration, 1953. 
1969. So let's start with Milton, why'd you get all the black work? Moselle jumped out a window. Your competition, your competition for album covers fell out a window. Wait, <laughs> oh my God, RC album vinyl. The story on this guy, look at all those album covers he did. And probably every time he had to go to New York and somebody found out he was black. Listen, he was a Grammy Award winner. He graduated from Parsons. He was as a kid, he would look at, his, look, look at his little kid picture. He was a Scholastic Award winner, went to Europe. And every time, every time a client found out he was black. Suppress, stop, minimize resource and money. The law. And even when the law was repealed in the hearts and minds the heart and mind, get it right, Cheryl. The heart and mind, it's in the culture. That was my sad question. Why? I get more questions than I do answers. But when I get a question with an answer, then I'm haunted until I tell you. Here's another one for you. You remember Ted? Remember the first picture? His best friend, his best friend is Vernon Cook. I don't know why there were 50, there were 50 to be scheduled, 49, not in the show. What, what happened to him? Did he like get mad? Was he kicked out? Did somebody say he wasn't good enough? You know, was he traveling? There were 50, he was the 50th and dropped out. He's Ted's friend from the army. What happened to Verdun Cook? There's Ted in the first picture I showed you with Ted. The show, what happened to him? Why Verdun, what, what happened? Douglas, I don't have a clue. I don't have a clue, there's no Google. I'm dancing in the streets, 1970, I graduated. Well, little did I know, you, we think student unrest in art school is new. Rhode Island School of Design, March 1970. Student takedown, can't we have more diversity? Last year, the cargo site, the scholars from RISD put up, they used this. We've been doing this since March, 1970, 50 years. Can we have diversity in art school? It started in Rhode Island School of Design. And I had no idea. This is the actual newsletter. The student demand take, we want diversity on campus. And I get an admissions and I didn't know. I didn't know, I had no idea that all of this diversity and I, I, got, I got an admission, came in 40, 40 or so black kids, they had come to recruit from the cities, Philadelphia, New York, and there was no diversity. It was just the Hispanic community was the Puerto Rican community. So it was black and Hispanic kids coming in. The minority recruitment program, 1970 freshman class. CA publishes the exhibit. April 1970. They publish it. In a card catalog, or you had to have been there. They recently put they recently put the article online. There's a link. But I'm really, really happy to say that Michael and Patrick, 
the publishers are republishing. They're still one of the few that still have a hard copy. They are republishing this article scheduled possibly for, for it's, it's should drop February. You wanna get your subscription. Um, and they have graciously invited me to write the intro preface. I am grateful that this will come out of card catalog. And some of, the, some of these notations and things that I'm telling you will be part of my commentary that will intro the article. I am grateful for the invitation to, you know, I'm a trade writer, so I'm grateful that they want my commentary. This is some of the sampling of um, the contextual conversation. And this is a history book, a history book that's been in the card catalogs and the archives and telling us who we are and documenting this story. Okay, now let me show you something real good. The story, the show travels. There's been a trajectory, and Mailer Ryder brought the show to RISD, April 1970. So, two things RISD did in response to diversity. Mailer Ryder, who was professor and known for his diversity and inclusion um, efforts and initiatives at RISD, he brings the show to the campus. RISD. Uh, creates the minority recruitment program. So RISD responds. He brings the show, uh, which Gary mentioned, and he's been a part of curating it with Hayes and Hopkins and 49 black designers, one missing in action. We don't know what happened to Mr. Cook. And then up until now, this fractal on Twitter, See, that's, this is why this is important to do. This fractal has been floating around that documents the show and the 49 black designers. Stay with me now. Nobody knows what this is. So I find it and I'm like, this going to be one of my, one of my, one of my questions. Why did, first question is, why the Japanese got us? What is this? And how come nobody knows what this is? And all we have is this little piece of fractal on Twitter that tells us the black, black artists and com graphic communication composing room, idea magazine. And nobody a fractal. Do you know how hungry we are for this history? Oh, well, so, like my mother's people say, well, so. Pro Professor Hiroshi. Ochi developed the 47 page article of 12 pages of color with Eli Cantor, Gallery 303, The Composing Room. He was the first art director for Idea Magazine and the complete show, the complete show is in Japanese. Published January 1971, number 104, Tokyo, Japan. He wrote, he's the first art director idea. He wrote to Dr. Robert Leslie, who is the director, okay, of the composing room. Dr. Leslie tossed it to Eli Cantor, and Eli Cantor, um, and I don't, can't pronounce it, whatever his name is, o Ochi. Just like Communication Arts published, they published the entire show. And I have seen, I have seen Douglas, the initial original correspondence from Eli Cantor and Professor Ochi, and they're coordinating we, in Japan, we want to publish the whole book.
Here's your Bible. Here's your second history book that I have found. The first was Ted's. He just wrote everybody out. And this is the entire show with blocks of English, but in Japanese. Okay. <laughs> this is how we do it. White folks aren't writing about us. So I study local Negro photographers and their archives. I found Moselle at Carnegie Mellon. The black photographer in Pittsburgh had his pictures. And oh, by the way, my family was in Pittsburgh. I found all my family with Moselle at Carnegie Mellon archives. <laughs> black photographer. Why? Listen, they, they photograph the funerals. They photograph for the obituaries the weddings, the church, the community organizations, local, my father's stuff, pictures of my family in DC. They're with Ed Hubbard and Addison Starlock. Addison Starlock, oh my God, his work is at the Smithsonian. You wanna see Negro life, you want Addison Starlock. There's every photographer, Atlanta, Chicago, okay? Their archives are somewhere. If you wanna see who we are and we celebrate ourselves because nobody's writing about us the negro photographer has our pictures look 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 we're pushing the pin back we couldn't dance on american bandstand in dc beverly lindsay she's award-winning Okay, she's been docu documenting in DC um, the Tina Rama dance show. Okay, and the story of black kids and, and dancing. We couldn't, you know, and then on the other side, other side of town, they had Wing Ding. Wing, Wing Ding was for the white kids. This is hair, the movie Hair. This was real. This was real. And you, we couldn't go Metro Media Channel 5. They had Milk, Milk Grant and then the Buddy Dean show. Okay, this stuff was real. Dancing in the park, dancing in the streets. Douglas, I told, I told AIG, ADC, I said, I'm approved to y'all, I'm from DC. I can teach you how to crack crabs and hand dance. <laughs> you, gotta be, you gotta be from DC for that, okay. All right, so Don Cornelius, He's working in 1970. He's got a show, WCIU TV Chicago. He said, okay, we're going to dance. Psychedelic, bell bottoms, but we're going to dance. Okay, and then he's syndicated to a wider audience, 1970. We got so tired. I was there. We got so tired of 17 Magazine and Vogue. Susan Taylor? They pushed back Essence Magazine, 1970. And do you think, Douglas, I always tell this on my lectures when I start moving into the 1980s, do you think for one moment that McDonald's woke up one day and say, oh, Burger King woke up one day and say, have it your way, we want black folks in our ass. No. No, the Ad Council pushed back the uh, New York Urban League. If we're going to drink your Coke, eat, eat your hamburger, you're gonna put us in ads and you're gonna put us in advertising jobs and thus the birth. Okay, there's a new book out of lecture. A gentleman just wrote, um, Blacks, in, Blacks in Advertising. I was there. Mingo Jones, Uniworld, Unigroup, Tom Burrell. In response to, oh no, you, if, if we're gonna eat and drink and back then it was cigarette smoke, okay, we're gonna be a part of making these ads and we're gonna be in them. And James Brown, this is, I'm black and I'm proud.
We're making our music, Barry Gordy. And these are your art directors, Curtis McNair, Harry Weber, Barney Wright, Frank Dandridge. I dig, I dig into Negro. And this is one here. You got to come from Chicago, DC. Okay, this one's a good one here. Muhammad Speaks. Oh, Elijah Muhammad had his own newspaper, okay. <laughs> he had his own newspaper, his archives, okay. The Afro, the Amsterdam News, everybody, every local Negro community had a newspaper. But this one's curious, Muhammad Speaks, okay. And I just got found out, Angela Wheeler at Micah, uh, Angela Wheeler at Micah, her family still owns the Afro. I'm like, oh, wow, and introduced me to her cousin who runs the archives. I'm like, oh, Cheryl Miller will be every other email because we are documenting our story because white folks aren't. And sure enough, the design community isn't. The only time they've ever done, anytime they've ever done anything is after black man has been killed. Reparation, reparation. I'm not mad, I'm just telling you how it was, Douglas. I had so many questions. It's just the questions that I did. Let me go find some answers. You know, and I'm known for giving you answers for questions people don't even think to ask others. Look, the story of John Johnson. He's, he, he is our, these books were our people magazine. All right, and Douglas, this is a real study. <laughs> This is a real study on our issues of colorism in our community. All of the women were fair skinned. This is, this is my pseudo aunt on the cover. She was a model. No, no, no brown, brown women on, on these mid-century jet magazines. But this was, I don't, which is a whole nother discussion. <laughs> Okay, that's a whole nother critical PhD, you know, studying, right. And here's some black history for you, you want it? Here, here is uh, Edgar Sims. Edgar Sims was printed the money and Courtney from Howard, Harvard, Courtney's grandfather, she's a part of the Harvard grad design conference. Her grandfather, designed a hundred dollar bill. See, so black men could become apprentice and they could work for the government. So you've got black men who are designing the money and printing the money. Okay, and all of these stories. So if I'm looking for photographers, if I'm looking for the artists and stuff, they're gonna be talked down into these stories. And see, look at your early graphics from the black community. What did I tell you? Geometric shapes, one color, one color in black and duotones. Your whole jet, it's a whole genre, a whole system. And just take it all the way back to Emory Douglas. This is our design system. I teach this too. Make something of it. Okay, this is our design system. There's a jet archive. Douglas, when you see since 1953, I think it started, all of them, what a system of design and the usage of one color black and a duotone. Graves, so Johnson, Johnson wanted to pick up the stories like People magazines, entertainment, celebrity, politicians, broad stroke, socialite, you know, you could find anybody's story of importance in Jet Magazine and Ebony. Graves, he wanted to show you that black men were in business and they were entrepreneurs. Oh, did I go back and give acknowledgement? John Johnson, Herbert Temple is your main art director for Johnson. Earl Graves, Maria Brown. And I got these from Graves' daughter-in-law. Okay, these original names. Um, Maria Brown, Vanessa Frazier, Jan Miller, Terrence Salsby, and Michelle, I don't know her duration, but she was there. These were their art directors. 
okay? And his agenda, let me show you black men making it. Douglas, six degrees of separation. This was my client base. Why? Because these were the men breaking into corporate America. My husband is contemporary and peers to the beginnings of these stories. So if I wanted corporate America work, which I did, I needed an executive to give it to me. These are the men who would be my clients. I wrote for them. I wrote, I wrote and Frank Brown, I wrote for the magazine. And I will sell, celebrate Roger Tucker's wife, Roger Tucker III. He was one of the designers of our era. His wife was the editor. And see, we, you gotta have a network. You have to have a community. And we were breaking into business in New York City. If I didn't know you firsthand, I knew you secondhand. One call, one call away to my client base. And then that led, um, that I, I'll come back just a little bit. This is a current work and I contend we gotta do better than this. This is uh, African Design Matters, Simon Charway, um, relevant design and art history that escaped our history books. See, this is our usual suspect. Let's not do the same thing that, that the white community has done. They take a usual suspects and they keep rehearsing them over and over and over again, over and over again. So these are your main list of folks, AIGA winners, all the way back to the forties. Okay, this is this, or you can't keep replaying them. Okay, they were good, they, they were wonderful. <laughs> they were wonderful, right along like we rehearsed, Rand, Saul Blast, Bass, Lou Dorsman. Oh God, it goes on and on. Seymour Quas, Milton Glaser. We keep making hit. So don't do the same thing, don't repeat it. So I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna find as many, as many as I can, that we don't do the same thing and just rehearse the same blogs, the same people, you know, the same reports. Well, I, I really appreciate this point. I want to take this moment to um, this point. I think it's really important just in terms of how in this time you've taught me so much about how many of us were left out of the stories, but in particular, in the last couple of slides, I've seen Michelle Washington associated with uh, uh, Black Enterprise. Uh, I, I work with her. I did not know uh, what her history was, as well as Dorothy Hayes. Um, she was uh, someone who I shared an office with when I was 25 years old when I started teaching. And I had no idea until all of the things that you're bringing to light about how pivotal she was in making sure that we were known. Um, and so I, I, I wanted to just jump in on that point because I really, I've been and writing down so many end. notes. Um, yeah. And I'm, I I'm coming to an sure. end. I'm, coming, yeah, so, I'm, I'm closing out. So okay. you can take your reflection and just yep. roll right on through. And I just want to say to the attendees, uh, I've been, and I put this in the chat, I've been writing down so many notes that I don't even know that I'm going to be able to pull out as many questions as I would like, but I know that you all have been as well. Please put your uh, questions in the chat so that we can at least address them before uh, we get to eight o'clock. Okay. And I'm here to the last question is answered. Uh, my favorite line is, I'm not new to this, I'm true to this. I'm <laughs> this is, um, I wanna shout out to Stanford. Um, it's a whole nother story. They came uh, across country with a tractor trailer and picked up Cheryl Miller um, collection, 50 boxes, 50 years. And uh, my, um, my, uh, my, my, my heart, my heart was to um, open up another collection so that all of this stuff will be in one place. If I could get as much of this in one place. And so we've opened up the history of black graphic design, North America. And I'm having the honor of meeting families and heirs of deceased um, graphic designers and they're donating um, ephemeral uh, to the um, uh, to the collections. We've at this point, I must have about 60 families that have been invited. Um, this is broad stroke um, of my firm's work and the collection 
it's been with all of my current housekeeping for AIG and Cooper Hewitt, um, I have scanned some of the primary pieces and um, the archives are uh, on, on online for you. And um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm a designer too. And all of this work is contextual. Um, a lot of it, two thirds of it is before Adobe. Um, I wanna shout out to um, my designers who transitioned the shop to Adobe and Danita Albert was my main. She, she and Trey are on the video for um, Cooper Hewitt. And um, they helped to move the um, office from, um, yeah, they, they helped move the office to, um, into Adobe, <laughs> off the drafting table into Adobe. Uh, just scanning here and looking, let's, let me talk, I, listen, bottom right was um, Gil Ashby, okay, um, I, listen, I gave everybody work. <laughs> That's Gil Ashby. Um, at the top left is uh, Charles Lilly. He's best known for um, Malcolm X um, cover. Um, the digital illustrations are, um, you know, that was brand new. Digital illustrations, brand new for BET's first, very first annual report. They just went um, public and um, I did their annual report and um, those digital, um, the cover and five with the page openers left. Um, Michelle Washington was um, dabbling with that. And I gave her, um, I gave her the inset, inside left section openers and the cover to do. Um, and um, I wanna shout out to Fo Wilson. Gave, we swapped work, we helped each other. Um, I was uh, doing advertorials and she was art director for YSB magazine, referred me to um, McDonald's to do an advertorial piece, um, um, a calendar and it slipped down into the magazine. And that's how my, McDonald's became my client. And we, an advertorial is, is an ad that is editorial. It doesn't sell a product and service, but it fits down within the context of a magazine. Um, my, um, Congressional Black Caucus is that poster sought after. I took, I did everything myself. That's all handwork back in the day. All of my logos are no Adobe, all handwork. And um, it's featured in a brand new book. I want to shout out to Kelsey Gray. Her new type, it drops this week, I think it is. Let's make letters. Um, she features my logo sheet and discussion about um, my, my process before Adobe. Um, this is my crew. This is the tribe up until this point. Okay, I got new, I got new folks, new allies, new story. Uh, there's some familiar faces and they all passed through Cheryl Miller, one way or the other. And it was a firm, that was my building. I was on the 15th floor, 353. That like, was I freelance out of my apartment? No, 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 no. It was a business. <laughs> and that was my husband who's been with me since I was 16. And um, he was my businessman and my friends and, you know, my, my friends, my editors. This is the crew, print magazine. Um, I got a shout out to uh, Julie Annister. She pulled me out. Yeah, she pulled me out of um, motherhood. Come on and let's go. Uh, you know, enough raising kids in in Connecticut. <laughs> you mean, <laughs> got me, awesome. Yeah, really, started really me. Yeah, so you you can see familiar faces: Robin Lynch, um, Maurice, Danita, Trey. They all listen. Uh, and my favorite, who's been everybody wants me to have a mentor. I don't have a design mentor. I had a rent, writing mentor, great editors, academic coach, um, fifty years, Dr. Leslie King Hammond. So anyway, this is my crew. Everybody, and I said in one of my um, uh, videos, if, if one of mine that came through aren't designers now, uh, it's because they don't want to. Listen, shout out, Ida B. Wells. I got a mentor, it's her. The way to right wrongs is turn, to turn the light of truth upon them. All I'm doing, Douglas, in this hour is giving you truthful footnotes. Shout out to uh, the Dorothy Hayes collection for everybody who wants to get in it. I just showed you some of it. 
It will not be available until November. It's being, they all come in and be processed. All of these collections that we're collecting are, are being processed. Um, and being processed means they go through it, they catalog it, they give them ID numbers, they put it online. Um, we don't have a digital process yet, but what's in the collection goes online. You can contact, um, you can contact Regina, uh, Regina Roberts, who's in, she's been working with me. She's the first one to come get mine, <laughs> okay? And then I've opened the door so that we can get everybody else's. I said, well, I wanna be at Stanford by myself. <laughs> so I said, let's do this. And so at this point, it's been about 60 invitations. Okay, and what's an honor for me, Douglas, is I'm meeting, I'm meeting families um, who are left with records in boxes. You know, for an example, I am so excited. I just met Mailer Ryder's daughter um, who has really not known what to do with his collection. And so that's an example. I get to meet um, Selden Dick's family. Uh, I'm meeting everybody and everybody's considering and we do have a list that's already in. So it's, it, it's gotta be about 55 to 60 people at this point. It started with 45 of us. The, the eldest, we, we, we got Reynolds Ruffins before he passed away. Um, and he's in the collection. His, um, his son, they signed the papers before they passed away. So I'm just hoping, and why Stanford? Um, because this is what Stanford does. Um, they haven't asked anything of me. And I'm gonna go with who will care for our story and spend the money to preserve it. So I'm hoping that eventually all of this will be in a place where um, we can do this research. I'm not writing the books for all of this. <laughs> I'm not, I just wanna get, you out of Google and 28 days, 30 days. That, listen, Dorothy, let me close. Let me close. Let me close. Oh, wait a minute before, I wanna shout out. Thank you to Lisa Barlow, who has been my life photographer. She takes, every time something happens, she's around. She documented Stanford coming to pick up my 50 boxes. Simon Charway, who's doing the directory. I'm not even gonna try Sasha. Sasha is <laughs> Sasha is at the Laura Bruel and Archive Center. I'm not gonna try his last name. Um, he introduced me to the um, uh, composing room archives. Um, all of the, every letter about this show is there. And the whole story, uh, the history I've been able to extract so many things of like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, there's such a story. Regina Roberts um, has um, believed in me from the very beginning. Coming, It was my thesis that she was looking for. And when she found me in the thesis, she found my, my collection and came all the way across country from um, California to Connecticut to get, to get my things. And um, I was honored. She said, this is one of the best collections I've picked up because um, it had been preserved, no mold. And I had everything cataloged because I knew I was doing important work. So I saved everything. Um, and Christina Santone is my sous chef in research. We, are, we, we, we have access to all types of archives and we do deep dig diving. Every time Cheryl has a question, I'm like, Christina! <laughs> and um, I shout out with that and um, She's in my new tra tribe, my resurgence tribe, because we go deep and my questions, this is an example of decolonizing. You know, I, got, I do deep, deep, deep dive every day. Um, and it's almost kind of like, I'm not much of a law of attraction lady, but it's almost like, oh, you're looking for that? And then all of a sudden I get, I get one thing after another out of the Dewey Decimal System. And it's not on Google. Okay, let me read this to you. And then we're gonna close here. This is from Dorothy, director, world typewriter. Time and time again, I've been asked by the advertising and publishing industries and corporations, where are the marvelous talent? Black artists, we are always hearing about but can never find. This indicates that for a young black artist, 
There has always been a lack of identification with the field of graphic communications, identifications that could inspire them to develop their individual talents. People spend a lot of time talking about what needs to be done and what they would like to do well. We didn't, we just did it. They put that show together. As a result, this show, Black Artists and Graphic Communication, communications was born. As for me, this exhibit represents my background, my present and my hope for the future. We're the future and you guys are the tomorrow. Do something with this lecture, be better than this story. There we go, I'll take questions until we're done. I hope you enjoyed that. Cheryl Miller's always got some more cooking. Um, I thank everybody. I thank Poster House. Uh, Poster House. Um, I thank everyone who has been engaged with me all of these years. Because that's the nutrition. I won't talk about. I won't talk to you about everybody who's hindered me. I'm going to celebrate and be grateful for everybody who let me in. Okay, Mr. Douglas. Well, I first want to just say, wow, uh, I don't know about all of you attendees. There are about 48 people who are still here, um, engaged to the very end. I wrote so many notes. Um, and I also want to thank Poster House as well, just for being so open to widening the lens on the show um, with this conversation, because there's so much more. And you so eloquently, as you always do, um, are able to pull those things out. So I, I want to thank you as well. Um, you taught me so much just in this hour and we've had several conversations. And so I've been trying to put together things from previous conversations. Uh, one of the things that really stuck with me is a quote that you said in, in the uh, interview that we did that I think is really relevant to a lot of the things that you showed today. And you said, the needle of design justice didn't move until the pandemic and George Floyd What's a shame is that kids today experience what I experienced 50 years ago. And that really stuck with me because um, just as you were talking through um, your experience as a living timeline through all of these other things that were going on, it really helped to make clear to me exactly um, how difficult it was, whether it be the point that you made about Reynolds Ruffins uh, being there as a founder of Pushpan as a fact and yet being unevenly included in the historical record, Dorothy Hayes not having a Wikipedia page or the suit against Micah, um, illustrating that black people couldn't go to school as well as the CA in 1968, um, uh, the article there, um, Jim Crow laws systematically oppressing black people. Um, I wanted to ask you in this, in this time as the first question and hopefully there's some more in the chat, um, could you talk a little bit more about the history of the tension when the trade groups had to decide whether to welcome the black artisan or whether to sort of gatekeep as a result of us being competition? Okay, well, all the way from, if you read my print magazine, October, 2020, I, I pretty much give you a sampling uh, of the footnotes. The scholarship, one of the main scholarships, uh, a gentleman who wrote, in the 70s, um, it's called, I think it's called The Other Slaves. I can't call his name right now, I got the book. I buy all of these things, <laughs> okay. Um, and W.E.B. Du Bois, um, we're, 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 you know, we're, we're fascinated by the infographics. Okay, okay, I, I'm mad with that. But read, <laughs> read the Negro artisan, okay? He's got a couple of books and yeah. You know, the Negro artisan and the slave artisan, I think he writes, I think they're two titles. And it's his, he's a sociologist. And so we're enthralled with his infographics, but read what he wrote. And so he, he starts talking about the systemic practice after slavery. So at emancipation, all of a sudden, the, the slave artisan, let's say, let's just take the slave artisan that worked at Williamsburg. Okay, now he's free, he's a pressman, okay? And now he's free, he becomes 
competition. And the white man says, oh no. And Du Bois tells you that the white man is afraid. I wrote it, I quoted him. The white man was afraid of this free competition that was just as good, he says, oh no. And so the trades, you can't work, back then you couldn't work without a union card. Okay, and one of the greatest stories is Douglas's, Frederick Douglass's son, I think his name is Leroy. You can Google this stuff or I have it, you know, I keep all of it. In fact, I was thinking about a library. Trey Seals called me other, yesterday. He says, auntie, can I use your research? I said, as long as you footnote me, you know, and so where'd you get that? <laughs> and I'm like, you know, I got a stack over here. And I was saying to myself, you know, Cheryl, it's one thing to have an archives. And I said, maybe you need, maybe you need a library. <laughs> okay. Um, and so, um, so what was I saying? Uh, my, my baby boomer moment. moment. So du, Bo du Bois is writing in this era about the trades. And what's curious with my women in women, black women in design with Tashika, okay? Um, we found, I knew, and we found, and we dug, and she found, okay, you know, you, you need a you need a partner to deep down digging. And the thing about me is I know things. So it's like, okay, we've got to find a footnote for it. <laughs> um Spelman Press. So the same era that Du Bois is writing. Spelman had a press, and we know that Spelman is women's college. So all of that work is a deep dive into Spelman. Okay, and so um, that era, and let me explain this trajectory so people can understand. All of us were in the trades. It was called commercial art. And white folks didn't want to be. Okay, so the pressmen, the artists, and back in the day, you had to you had to, I, I, I've always been in a transition of technology and education. Things are changing. We can go this way or you can go that way. What, when I wanted to go to art school, there were two ways. You could go to art institute or you could go to art college. The art institutes were just becoming accredited. All right, so the old school way was you had to be an apprentice and you worked your way up. If you wanted art, you would come in as a pay stop artist. And black folks never got past production. And even now, when I see these LinkedIn jobs, um, digital production, I'm like, don't you dare, don't you dare. All they've done is change the name. You take a d digital production job, you're, you're gonna be right there on that drafting table. Well, this really, um, for me, it made the connection between a lot of the questions that people ask today, you know, where are the black designers, but, you, you've gone through and showed us the first times people were asking those questions so long ago, but what really made the connection for me in terms of why we're not as represented is the fact that we're not being um, written about, right? Nope. We were left out of, of that history, but also that the trades sort of created this line, this wall that you couldn't break okay, in. Okay, let me, let me tell you what happened with that. Okay, so they wouldn't, they wouldn't give us the cards to work. And then finally, you know, between the laws and stuff, they had to sit next to us in the trade, in, 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 a, um, in a union meeting. This is union stuff, okay? So you know what they did to get away, get away from us? You know what they did to get away from us? Because we're all there together. The, the, they separated the design thinking from design and they made the art schools, 1949, I think it is. So the association, ACAD and they said the early, the, let's take the, and now you gotta go to school to do the design thinking part of the business. So when you pull, if you take the intelligentsia out and the, and the thought out, the art direction out, then you're left, the trades are left with Negroes with ink under their fingernails and lack of thinner in their lungs. We were all there together. And then they raised the bar again. They made, they took the Art Institute and then they became colleges. So the only way to perform is now you got to go to school. 
Well, who can go to school? You're not letting the sign in, who can pay? So black folks, if anything, the pressmen, the type, the liner type and all of that, ink under their fingernails and lack of thinner in their lungs. And, and the only other place of training in small studios and things, you had to have an apprenticeship. And who was gonna take you in? And who, who was gonna be fair with you to let you do paste up? It was, it was an order, a step. You do paste up, then you do layout, then you do design, and then you can be an art director. You had to apprentice your way up each step. And if black folks got in, you stayed on the you stayed on the paste up table. Mm. You stayed on the paste up table. They weren't gonna let you advance up. So that was one way. Or you go to college and get BFA. And the school started, everybody was an institute. And then they started going into the associations and becoming accredited. Mm. This is this is late 40s, 50s, and how this was. So by the time I got to finish school. You know, there was still you could you could still go the art institute route and go the apprentice route if somebody would take you in. And the only way that my father was going to let me do this at all was you better come up with a way to go to college. And I came up with Rhode Island School of Design, and that's why my art teacher fought me so. Mm -hmm. My father had to go sh shake down the councils to get my transcript out of that school. Mm -hmm. Well, this really helped uh, to put into context for me why when you read those 49 Black designers, um, with the exception of Gordon Parks and John Morning and um, Dorothy Hayes, I didn't recognize most of them. And you've explained to me why and how systematically from the different pieces that you presented, why that is. And so I know for me, I really learn so much every time I talk to you and I really appreciate you talking through all that and I don't know Salvador whether we and have I, yeah and I want to make a point about those 49 in the exhibit they were ones who made it right. and that was the point that was the point of her show these are basically New York based and, or you know derivatives okay these are making it these are art directors these are working you know these these we are here There'll be 50 of us. And they curated the show. There was a call for entry. All right. So you just didn't get in because you knew, knew Joyce and Dor Dorothy. Okay. Um, there was a selection committee. There was a call, call for entry. Mm. And um, you, you had to definitely be working. And so these guys, you know, the titles. The, 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 their titles. No, that's not. It. I'm not going to bore you with more names. Wait. You have to read the article. They all had titles. <laughs> they all had titles. Okay. We'll do. They all, they all, I got them. I got them. They're all over here. They all had titles. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the 59 had titles. And the and the, the selection committee all had titles. Yeah. What they what they what they did. So these were these were 49 making it graphic right. designers and artists. Well, and, again, and the whole point was to tell, stop asking, looking for us. Here's 49 yeah. of us. Well, I really, uh, gosh, you know, I, I just want to just end on this note and let everyone who uh, was a participant and who was listening just know that, uh, and I mentioned this earlier, but when I, again, when I started teaching, 25 years old, I'm standing in the doorway at um, Professor Hayes' office, and we ended up sharing an office at the end of her career, and I knew she was a pioneer. I knew that she was someone who had established herself and, and done so many amazing things within the industry. But until you, Cheryl, tonight, and even the previous conversations that we've had, until you sort of brought all of it to life within the context of why and how it all happened uh, in terms of Professor Hayes, my own colleague, uh, I didn't know. And so I just wanna say uh, thank you for filling in those blanks for me, as well as just helping me understand the larger context of why things are the way we, that they are within the industry. Um, that in and of itself were things that I really appreciate 
and just along with listening to you as just a living timeline to really, um, you know, it's really easy to read something in a book and, and it's sort of removed from what your lived experience is as a person if you didn't live in that time. But for you to speak uh, from experience within that time as a living timeline, I, I know I learned so much and I really appreciate what you share every time I get a chance to listen to you. And so I wanna say thank you for having this conversation. I wanna thank the Poster House as well, yeah, um, just you. again, for being willing to have a conversation that widens the lens on um, what the show is in order to make sure that we're having a complete and a more full conversation that in and of itself is really valuable. And I wanna say thank you to all the attendees. Oh, thank you. And remember the first thing I said when I started, I gave you a charge when I opened up. Right, about asking be, you what- uh, be, be better than this lecture. Be better, right. And be also better. we wanna hear we want to hear what else you have cooking up. So hopefully we can do some follow-ups. Miss um, <laughs> Miller, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Um, and to all the participants, please, uh, if you go to Poster House, um, check out the show um, as well as um, hopefully you can become a member. And uh, Salvador, I'm not sure whether there are any other things that we need to yeah. do. Yeah, and Salvador, you know, I don't, I, I, you know, we're a few minutes past our hour, but I'm always an encore lady. If anybody has one more question, I, 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 I always find me on LinkedIn. That's the best place to catch me. Um, I think it's C.D. Holmes Miller, LinkedIn. Um, not, not my church girl one. <laughs> you don't want to go on that LinkedIn. You want to be on the LinkedIn. <laughs> You want to be on the LinkedIn, Cheryl D. Holmes Miller. Find me over there. Um, and, you know, I love an encore because I don't, I didn't have anybody, Douglas. And I never want to leave um, any question unsaid or done because it might make a difference in someone's life. And not that I know it all, but God knows I've seen it almost all there is to see <laughs> through yeah. the, wait, through the psychedelic era. I know I've seen that. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Is there one more question before we go, Salvador? You see anything? Anybody have raised their hand? If you got one, you just got to have me answer. Cheryl, you know, I'm only seeing effusive compliments. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing your history. Thank you. Thank you. All, all I see is, is, is huge, huge outpouring of gratitude um, okay. in the comment section. And right. I just want to like echo that sentiment myself. Cheryl, you've been so, so generous with Poster House in not only your time in this evening, but in all of the preparation up to this. We really, really appreciate you doing the work to expand yeah. the canon of what institutions are missing. Our own yeah, um, and Douglas, of course, thank you for being so generous with your time uh, for moderating. Um, and all of you for attending. And uh, the Pushpin Legacy is on view at Poster House through February 6th. Uh, please do come by and visit. Uh, and we are open uh, Thursday through Sunday and free every Friday. Um,